Well, I'd like to acknowledge all of y'all being here with today. And this is going to be kind of an informal, este, platica, como cafecito con la tía. Pata el pan dulce, you know, we're going to be talking about like that. And uh, uh, I'm going to like to start with Mrs. Pringle. You know, the challenges that we're seeing today across America in terms of education, especially the whitewashing of the curriculum and schools, uh, the ability to hire more minority teachers and principals in our education system, and the challenges that we're seeing by elements of a certain political party to defund public education. What do you think how we should respond to that, and what is NEA doing on it? So, uh, good morning. Um, uh, I am an eighth grade science teacher. I taught science for over 30 years before becoming an officer of the National Education Association. I am proud to represent three million members of the largest labor union in this country. And I can tell you, having taught for that long, it is a bit shocking that you even are asking me that question. In this moment, it's, 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 it, I've been on this earth for a minute. And I will tell you that throughout my, my tenure as a teacher and certainly as a labor union activist, I've never uh, seen a time such as this where our primary work is to defend our students' right to learn and our teachers' right to teach. You know, we've, throughout history, we've seen book bans come and go, but we've never seen um, uh, uh, it spread across this country where there are actual laws banning books, where authors who we know have spent their lives fighting for love and liberation find themselves on, the band, on a banned book list. I'm not the first teacher in my family. My dad was a teacher. He's a history teacher. And he used to try to make me and my two sisters sit and listen to him tell us history. Well, we were having none of it. We didn't want to listen. To, I, didn't want, I wish he were here with me today because I would love to be able to talk to him about what's happening. But what he would say to me is, Rebecca, that's what he called me when he was really mad or very serious, Rebecca, you need to understand, you need to know and understand your history. And at any point in time, it doesn't matter what society or what dynasty or what, what um, uh, uh, elected leaders in a country or region, when you see them starting to take away the right to learn from its citizens, you will always see that plateauing and the falling off of that society. Because we understand that education is actually the, the foundation of a democracy, of this democracy, of any democracy. It is the foundation of it. And when we do not allow our students to develop those critical thinking skills, those collaborative problem-solving um, opportunities, then we know that they aren't going to have the opportunity to be the, the, the leaders of a just society. And so at the NEA, the very first thing we are doing is making sure that we are leading a movement to not just reclaim public education as a common good, but we are uniting our NEA members and all of you and everybody everywhere to actually make sure that public education as that foundation is a racially and socially just and equitable system that prepares every student, every student, everyone to succeed in this diverse and interdependent world. So first of all, you have, we have to understand what is happening in this moment. As we promote public education as that cornerstone of democracy, as we protect it from all of the vouchers and the uh, uh, privatization that's happening right now. And then we have to strengthen it because it was never actually designed for people that look like me or that look like you. So we actually have to strengthen it in a way that when we say every, we actually mean every. So we have to, we have to start there. When we think about the work as educators and you, all of you, as allies, 
to do all of that, it is embedded in what I said that it has to be our shared responsibility. It cannot just be us. We're big, but we can't do it by ourselves. All of us have to come together to ensure that we not only have the resources and the funding we need for our students, but that we are preparing educators, we are preparing our college students to become educators and diversify our profession, and we are standing up and using our voices in this moment to demand what we know our students need and what they deserve. I do want to announce also that today uh, we are announcing a LULAC partnership uh, with the Natural Education Association uh, starting today. And they're also making a sizable contribution to LULAC to start that partnership and get that going. So, muchísimas gracias. All right. Uh, Mr. Olmos, again, yeah, you played Jaime Escalante, a uh, high school teacher who was working with kids that were facing challenges and nobody believed it. What do you think are the challenges that we're facing now in education? And what should we be doing as a community to try to overcome those and make a difference? One is uh, to understand what uh, the president just finished saying. That's the most important thing. And what you just ex explained right now is the single most important aspect of understanding our history, understanding that the more you know, the, the more you understand yourself, and the more you can help others. And the key to education is to get it. <laughs> it's kind of hard sometimes to get a good education because we're fighting against people that don't want to understand our history the, the way it really is. The truth is always the only way to go. But sometimes you don't get the truth. And the, all I can tell you is that please search out the truth and move forward. And the key to, to for me is always to give the kids a chance. And uh, that's what I've been doing now for the last uh, 26 years, 27 years. I mean, since I did Stand and Deliver, which became, by the way, the single most viewed film in the history of film ever in the United States. Wow. <laughs> More than, more than, more than Gone with the Wind, more than Jaws, more than Star Wars, more than, uh, you know, all of the, you know, E.T., all of these incredible, incredible movies that made billions of dollars, none of them have been seen as much as Stand and Deliver. Do you know why? Because tens of thousands of teachers use it every single year and have for the last 40 years to teach their classrooms. That to me is the essence and the strength the essence and the strength of what I consider to be the most important art form that, is, that humankind has ever created. Nothing attacks the subconscious mind more than the audio-visual event, whether it be off your telephone now, or your iPad, or you know, your computer, or on television, or on the big screen. Nothing attacks the subconscious mind more. Every image that you're looking at goes straight in and goes in there and stays in there it doesn't leave you. Just because you can't remember it, it's in there. And some of us can remember it, and that's where IQ comes in. How much can you remember from what you learned when you were 10, 11, 15? You know, that is the essence of life. And then when you get into your 70s like I am, it's hard to keep on doing that. You, get, you start to lose a sense of understanding and opening those little doors and being able to open them. I can open them, but it takes a little bit of time. I'll have to say sometimes, oh, I'll get back to that. But, and you continue speaking because I, you can't remember, you know, names especially <laughs> and dates. So there goes history. But all I can tell you is that the key to your life is education. And that comes through a, a multitude of ways. And w when you take responsibility for yourself is when it becomes most effective. When you discipline yourself to do the things you love to do, when you don't feel like doing them, you become the best that you can be, period. Not better than somebody else, but the best that you can be. And that's all I could ever ask of you. Just be the best you and move forward. We've been helping children in a way that is unbelievable. I've been talking to Domingo about this, and we started to talk a little bit about it. It's called the Youth Cinema Project. And uh, I gotta tell you right now, it is unprecedented what this project has been able to do, especially in the last 10 years. 
Right now we're in 115 classrooms in California and we're there for um, from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year in the classroom. And we, we usurp the English uh, sp spot. And I'd like to s send, if I could, yeah. I'd like to hand it over to yeah. Rafael and let Rafael. Rafael, is the, if you can uh, talk to us about, I think uh, I got here that the LA Times said, arguably California's most innovative and successful education initiative is the Youth Cinema Project that you're heading up. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what you and uh, uh, Mr. Olmos are doing on this area. Yeah, of course. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, let me begin by saying that I, I am the proud byproduct of public education. Um, I need to admit that um, when I went to elementary school, I was an English learner. And today, I write for English language television. Um, I, I wrote for a show called Jane the Virgin, in case anyone saw that. Um, but let me also confess that when I went to public school as an elementary school student, I was an undocumented student. And today I sit on the National Film Preservation Board at the Library of Congress. So I know that public education can be life-changing. But because I was undocumented, there's something I discovered. Um, because of our status, every, we moved a lot. My parents tried to get jobs when they couldn't uh, sustain those jobs because their immigration statuses were found out, we moved. I went to eight different schools before I got to high school. And what I realized is that I was the worst student in one school, but student of the month at the affluent white school. So the student never changed. What changed was the school system. And I learned that at 11 years of age, that the only difference in all of my education was always school funding. And that's what's so heartbreaking. So to come back to the original question about the Youth Cinema Project, we didn't revolutionize education. We're doing filmmaking. What we did is we discovered that project, filmmaking is the best expression of project-based learning because of the amount of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity that goes into the classroom. And the most brilliant thing, I have to give credit what credit is due, is that Mr. Almost told me that when I'm speaking to superintendents and board of trustee educators, what he said was, tell them to put the program in their least achieving schools, in the schools that most need an injection of excitement and innovation. So what was brilliant is that we didn't go in to say, oh, we wanna work with like Latino students. We simply said, put us in your lowest achieving schools because we knew those were the least funded schools and we also know that the least funded schools are always filled with black and brown kids. So that's exactly why we decided to create the Youth Cinema Project, to find a different way of teaching our students, our community that are always left behind. Ms. Pringle, in this audience, we have college students from throughout the United States. We also have some high school students from throughout the United States. What would, advice would you give them as they're moving forward in their careers on what they should be doing? You need to become a teacher. How many of you are thinking about that? <laughs> Raise your hand. Oh, yes, give it up, give it up, give it up, yes! Okay, I wanna see a few more hands than that. You know, um, uh, I, I always wanted to become a teacher. From the time I used to make my two sisters play school on the steps of our, our North Philly home, I'm not exactly sure why my, my, big, my older sister put up with it because she beat me up on a regular basis. I don't know. But, you know, it was just a joy of my life to, you know, if they did all of their lessons just right, they graduate to the second step. And if they answered all the math questions right, then they graduated to the next step and we had six steps. By the time they got to the six steps, then I would tell them, tell them both, if they did it all right, then they could get promoted to the first step. And we start again. So I always wanted to be a, a teacher, but I will tell you that one of the things that I realized when I um, uh, stepped into my first middle school classroom is that I didn't, I, I didn't have a clue. I, I didn't have a clue about a lot of things, but one of the things I didn't have a clue about was that it actually was my professional responsibility and my moral obligation as, a, as an educator to care about the kids uh, outside of the confines of my own classroom. It's why I got involved in the union, so that I could have a collective voice to fight for them. 
And so when I talk to young people, first of all, I beg them to come and follow me into the profession. We are working on addressing those issues that we know have been challenging for us to recruit and to retain, especially teachers of color. And we're going in the wrong direction at a time when our students really, really need us. So we are fighting for higher salaries. We've never been paid in a way that's commensurate with the important work we do in this society. And we are fighting and winning those higher salaries. We are fighting for the respect and collaborative autonomy that we should have as professionals. We're fighting for those things, mostly. We're fighting to make sure that our students have the resources that they need so that we can do the jobs we love. So whether or not you choose to follow me into the teaching profession, please do. Or you decide on an, another profession, it still is your responsibility to know and to learn and teach others. Because here's the thing, like I said, I didn't know when I started, but now I know. I have to make sure that I play my role in ensuring that those who are elected and appointed to positions of power care about my kids. And they care about my colleagues. And they care about the promise of this country. That's my responsibility. And I can't stop there. Even when in the, they're in those positions. That's part of the work you'll do over these next, this next day or so You're in, in the legislative conference. We've got to make sure we have laws, um, and that we have the resources, that we are protecting our right of students uh, who we know have been historically marginalized to have access to early childhood education, to make sure they have ELL teachers that are there for them, to ensure that they have access to arts and music, to that full range of curriculum, to make sure they have an honest and complete history of this country and that we have that environment that sees them as the whole humans they are. So regardless of whether you are in the profession or not, you have a role to play to create that world that I just described. All right, uh, Mr. Olmos, uh, you know, it really kind of um, what's, I'm trying to find the right word without going through a four-letter word. Something that pisses me off is when I go to the movies and all the superheroes, there's no Latino or Latina there. Okay, I think uh, was it uh, Blue uh, Beetle was the first one, uh, but before that, nada. When you watch TV, there's very few Latino or Latina actors. You're a pioneer. You were one of the first ones. I remember seeing you in Miami Vice, and you were probably the only Latino actor back in that time period. And uh, for those young men and women here who might want to look at a career uh, in film or in acting, ¿qué consejo les puedes dar? What recommendations can you give to them? Now is the time to do that, live that dream, and live it with a tremendous sense of understanding that if you were going to be a doctor, you'd have to study to be a doctor. If you wanted to be a lawyer, you're going to have to study to be a lawyer. And I mean study hard and go through a lot of school. Well, guess what? You want to be an actor or a filmmaker? You want to be in front of the camera or behind the camera? You want to be able to be a storyteller? You must educate yourself to the fullest. Don't think you can do it on your looks. <laughs> Trust me. And if you're in it, your intention equals your content. The intention in which you come into the art form, whatever art form you choose, will always come out in the content. You won't even be able to see it, understand it, but a person of age who's been involved in the art form will turn around and say, well, this person's doing it for money, this person's doing it because they're, they got an ego problem. They <laughs> think you, you, you expose yourself. The arts expose you. So I say to you, do it. We need you more now than ever. We need you to become great writers. We need you to become great artists, whatever kind of art, whatever discipline you want to go into. We really need that because the arts are the expression of the soul, of the body, okay? The art is like the backbone of the human body. It allows the messages to get from here, whatever message, all the way to my toes because of the backbone. I break the first or second bone in my backbone, I become, you know, 
paraplegic and then if I break anymore, I become quadriplegic and I can't move. None of the message gets through. Well, the art forms, whatever art form, is um, the reason that we have the ability to go from the brain to the rest of the human body. And that is so important because, like you say, and uh, you're exquisite. I'm so happy that I'm sitting here with you and getting to know you this way because this is amazing. You're an amazing human being. And the reason is because she's dedicated herself, dedicated herself to helping the children. I've been doing it now for about 27, 28 years. And again, my movies, uh, The Ballad of Gregory Cortez, uh, Selena, Mi Familia, American Me, <laughs> Walk, you know, Walk Out, um, never would have been made had I not been in the position that I'm in. And the reason I'm in this position is because I worked hard seven days a week. And I still, to this day, work seven days a week. Not six, not five, not four. Seven days a week. That doesn't mean that's the only thing I do during the day. No. But I do make sure that I understand myself and my craft at least for 10 minutes to an hour, maybe two hours per day, every single day, seven days a week. It's like brushing your teeth. People say, how can you do anything seven days a week? It's easy. How many of you brush your teeth? <laughs> oh, really? Well, my wife's a dentist. She definitely brushes your hand. What the hell do you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you retired from brushing your teeth? Come on. <laughs> no, participate. The reason we brush our teeth it's because we don't want to have bad breath. We don't want to have bad gums. We don't want to hurt ourselves. We don't want to brush our teeth. Nobody gets up in the morning going, oh, I can hardly wait. Oh, this is so wonderful. <laughs> no, you get up and you go, okay, here we go. We've got to get to this one. Well, you're doing something that you don't even like to do, and you're doing it seven days a week. Now, that using the same discipline that you would use to brush your teeth, in other words, making yourself do something that you have to do, when you don't want to do it, you can do the same thing to things that you love to do. So find what you love to do, and if you want to be in the, especially in, in my business, when we, when uh, Raphael was talking about the Ameri the uh, Youth Cinema Project, this program instills, from the moment they touch it and start moving in, it instills self-esteem, self-respect and self-worth to the individual that's touching it. Do you know what happens when you infuse a 10-year-old child with self-esteem, self-respect, and self-worth? Do you have any idea? You wanna cry? I can cry right now with just what I've been able to accomplish in the last 10 years. Right now, there's 1,500 kids right now that are getting infused with <laughs> self-esteem, self-respect, and self-worth, learning how to use their, like he says, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, creativity, the essence hallmark of what we as human beings need. I don't care. We're not trying to make filmmakers, okay? That is not the essence of what we're doing. What we're doing is making lifelong learners. So you young people that are in here, put it down there. Youth Cinema Project, put it in your phones, and then you look it up, and you, you go Google it. And then you ask your principal at your school, get this program here to our school. Get it over here right away. We are now going to go national. And that's what I'm talking right now with LULAC about. And Domingo's got the big responsibility of having to listen to me. Because I tell you right now, there's no one that doesn't win with this program. The parents win. The kids win. The school system wins. In one of our schools we went in, the very first school we ever went into, the first school system we went into, Santa Ana, they were losing 400 kids in one year to uh, you know, the different charter schools all over, right? We came in with our program. Within the first year, 600 kids came back because they wanted to be, a, it, we only do public schools. Parochial schools, parochial schools, <laughs> parochial schools want it. You know, <laughs> all kinds of very, very wealthy schools want it. And look at when we get to the point of our children having it in, in public schools, in in places where we really need it, and the kids that really need it are the ones that can't speak English well. 
the kids that uh, are lacking. When you don't, when you can't read up to a third grade level, and they push you through from the third grade to the fourth grade level, you're going to lose that kid. It's proven. It's everybody knows that's what happened. The kid cannot read. He goes into the fourth grade, and if you were scared in the second grade, third grade, you know, because you couldn't keep up with the class and you couldn't speak the language, and you go into the fourth grade, forget it. You're like, you sit in the back of the room, you don't even look at people. When we come in with our program, the kids come into school and they're like this, especially the girls, they're just like very quiet, very shy. They're just like, they don't, can't even look at you in the eyes. Right now, there's one kid right now that can't look at me in the eyes. Every single one of you is doing that. Every one of you. Why? Something inside of you is strong. Something is able to sit here and go, yeah, let me listen to this guy. You know, you're not sitting there humble and trying to, you know, I don't want anybody to see me in this room. That's the key. The key is to infuse that feeling in a child. And when you start in the fourth grade, there's a reason we start in the fourth grade. It really does make a big difference. They learn from the very first day that we walk in and we break the classroom up because we don't, we're 21st century teaching now. We're not teaching like you learned and that you're still in your school classroom right this moment. You're in your classroom and you sit there in your desk this way, everybody, and the teacher's up at the chalkboard or in front of you and they're, you know, they're talking to you like this and everything is incredible. It's been that way for hundreds of years now. That's how we teach, right? We walk in with two mentors, two masters in filmmaking that come in, not tell you anything other than what you are as a human being. And we start off by allowing you to describe yourself in little groups of six to eight per group. And we change all the seating. We change all the chair, all immediately destroy the, 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 the room and the teachers like, you know, because we were there for 90 minutes twice a week. Do you know what 90 minutes twice a week gets you? A whole lot. That's what they do in college. You go to college, you, you got about an hour, an hour and a half of, of teaching twice a week, and that's a, you know, a three-unit class. In whatever class you're taking, that's how much you get. But well, we're doing the same thing. When we're done teaching, when we're done with the day, kids are so proud of themselves, and they can look at you. And you, kids that couldn't speak English, we got into one program. Tell them about the program real quick. Yeah. Uh, and I do brush my teeth, by the way. I just want to say that. Um, we, we, went, we went into a high school, and the principal in that particular school wanted us to do the program for their uh, kids who were not English proficient. Um, and then within one semester of doing the program, 30 out of 32 students tested out and became English proficient. And that, that is the difference and of, at of having the, a program where people are so engaged. By the end of the school year, all 32 were English proficient and writing in English and speaking in English. And the key was that they were using it daily and had to because they wanted to participate. They, want, they had the ganas. And like Jaime said, once you got the ganas, it's over. You give me the ganas, you give me your strength, and, and you feel confident, I'll get you through it. And, and Jaime taught that, and he taught it so well that he took <laughs> kids that were, you know, that were not doing anything, and they were in high school in their first year of math, and they were just, you know, it was a throwaway class, and they became the best calculus and mathematicians in the United States of America for the year that they, grabbed, they, they took their AP calculus test. They surpassed Stuyvesant. They surpassed the finest schools in America, the most wealthy schools. That the students couldn't keep up with these kids, 18 of them, and all of them were Latino. All of them. Rafael, uh, <laughs> Lulac has been involved in education for a long time. I remember, uh, you know, in Lulac, there was a young girl named Anna Mendez um, who went to the Westminster School, but she was in the Mexican school, and she wanted to go to the white school, and they wouldn't let her in in 1948. And Lulac filed a lawsuit uh, ending school segregation in California with Richard's predecessor, Topeka versus Brown. And then in the 60s, Lulac had the School of the 400. And if you learned 400 words in English, you would be better prepared to go to first grade. 
and uh, Lady, Bur uh, Lady Bird Johnson and LBJ uh, adopted that and made it Head Start, which, how many of y'all went to Head Start? Yeah, that was a LULAC program, okay? And then in the 19, I, I went to school, I got spanked for speaking Spanish. Pásame la bola, three licks from Mr. Smith, the principal. And then LULAC in the 70s fought for bilingual education so that kids could be transferred. What do you think the, the, the Youth Cinema Project and, and what we as Latinos here in the, you know, 2024 now can do to change the lives of the young men and women that are coming up? I do believe it's what Ms. Romo said about the self-esteem, self-respect, and self-worth. Um, there's a great book called Schools on Trial, and in it, the author argues that the highest achieving schools, the private schools, the schools that all pop public policy makers send their kids to, the, the two biggest and most important pillars in those schools are freedom and creativity. Those are the first things taken away from our public schools. Why? Because they're... Our public schools, unfortunately, are not interested in creating leaders like this organization is. Our public schools are interested in creating workers. And we, we teach leaders separately in a different way. So that's what we try to do with the Youth Cinema Project. It's not only do they become self-directed learners, learners, they become leaders in the classroom. We democratize the learning experience for them. We don't teach them um, what to write. We just show them how to write. We don't tell them what to write, is what I'm saying. Um, and I think a big Con, uh, misconception, especially with film education programs, is that people are like, oh, I can't wait to grab a camera. But unless you know how to read and write, you have nothing to do with a camera. So the first semester, all we do is focus on reading and writing. With a pencil and a piece of paper. That, that's it, because... I'm you. Curse, they write. Yeah, and then, then they get computers after. You can use a computer after. And the excitement of creating a film, they don't even realize that they're learning. And that's, that's the trick of what we discovered of the work that we do. Imagine sitting there at a table and you ask people around the table that don't speak English very well, and, and they're the kids, and they don't even, can't look at you in the eye, and you ask them, just let's give me two sentences, of a story, just any story. You know, you went across the street, you bought a candy bar, you came back, and the candy bar had ants on it. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, anything, just anything that comes into your mind. And you're sitting there and all of a sudden you hear, you know, this little girl or little boy and she's very chopped up being the same. Uh, 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 a little boy and his grandmother go across the river and the grandmother can't make it, but the little boy makes it. He gets across the river, sees that his grandmother isn't there looks around for somebody to help, nobody's to help. So he goes back across the river to look and he can't find his grandmother. So he goes back across the river and he starts his life on the other side. I go, now that's a story. I wonder where you got that one. That reality that he faced, I'm sure he faced that reality. It's the only way he can speak that way. And he's, he lived that life. That was his life. Now he writes, I said, okay, that's perfect. Let's write it down. And then he starts to write it in English, which he doesn't do very well. And we help him go through the situation of writing it. But now he wants to write it. And so he takes it home and he works on it. And for the next class meeting, he's got it. And, and he's done whatever he has to do to make sure. And he starts, he's thinking and going and doing it at home. And he does it and he comes back the next time and pre more prepared and they shares it, and they start to read it. And then from those stories, you go into learning how to do story li lines, and then you learn how to do short stories, and then you learn how to, to write a script. And every little story that's done by each one of these, they have to pick. They have to read them out loud, and then they have to pick amongst themselves, the six of them, which of the stories is the best. Try doing that one in the fourth grade. You're sitting there going, well, you know, you think, well, you know, mine can't be that good, or mine is as much better, or sure, hers is much better. Hers. Boom. All of a sudden, communication, collaboration happens. All of a sudden, you're able to look at somebody and give them the right, say, you wrote a really good story. Let's do that. And then that's, that student, that story gets done by the six of them. 
and one of them becomes a director, one of them becomes the producer, one of them becomes the, the cinematographer, another one becomes the sound person, another one, you know, they, they break up into the different departments. And we teach everything from, from conceptual understanding of a storyline all the way through pre-production, all the way through production, all the way through post-production. We even teach you how to build an LLC, do marketing and merchandising also. By the time you're out of that classroom, what, what, the, what the American Film Institute said when they came to see the program, they wanted it, the program. They saw it, they came, they didn't want to be there. They didn't want to, when are we going to go to a fifth grade class and watch fifth graders, you know, 11 year olds. You know, what are we doing here? We're the American Film Institute, the number one film institute in the world, in the world, okay? And we're standing here, all of the heads of the departments are there. And they go, we're only going to give you 10 minutes. They spent the whole 90 minutes, and they all cried. It makes you cry. When you see this development, it makes you cry. When you see the light bulbs go on, and they're not even paying attention to the grown-ups in the room. They're, 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 they get into it, and pretty soon they realize what they can do, and pretty soon they're doing it. And, and so we teach them how to use the equipment, but we never touch the equipment. When they, once they, get, they know how to use it, then they're the ones who do everything. They edit at the, in post-production, they edit, they write their own music if they want to, they can get the music wherever they want to get it from. They do all, they do casting, they do location scouting, they do all the things that you have to do in a movie. Now, we're not trying to make movie makers. Remember, some of them will become very good movie makers, I'm telling you, but what we're trying to make is lifelong learners and they're learning how to use themselves and feel confident. Every teacher that has ever gotten one of our students has gone through this program to the next grade say, these kids come in to the classroom a whole different way than the rest of the class. And you know what the biggest complaint is? From the PTA, why aren't you, why aren't, because parents are saying, why wasn't our child given that class? That's, the, that's why it's spreading so quickly. But and that's why we're now ready to go with the help. Of, I hope you can help us do this. See, I feel like a student in Stand and Deliver ahorita. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I already got an idea. My crazy Mexican quinceanera. <laughs> uh, Madam President, uh, uh, we're in some tough times with uh, local school boards being targeted for takeovers by extremists that are trying to whitewash history, trying to ban books, ban mentions of Cesar Chavez, ban mentions of Martin Luther King. What can we do when we go back and we're facing those kind of challenges at our local school districts or our local hometowns? What do you recommend we do? Or they do right here. So first of all, everyone wants their public school to look like what we heard just described, right? That's, that's what we want. And whether we're talking about film or we're talking about uh, students learning how to, to grow community gardens or whether they're learning about dance or whether they're learning about science. What you've just heard described <clears throat> is experiential learning. And I, I mentioned I wanted to start there honestly in answering your question because it can't just be about what you're fighting against because what you just described is the crazy and the stupid. We gotta fight against the crazy and the stupid. And the hate and all of those things, we do. And we have to know what we're fighting for. We know, we know what our students need and what they deserve. We know what a great public school looks like. And 80%, and 80% of the richest people in this country send their students to public schools. You know why? Because those public schools have Olympic-sized pools. They have art and they have film. They have robotics. I had the opportunity to visit a classroom, again, a spiritual learning, where the students were learning science and math through robotics, where they actually worked with UPS, the students, the high school students, we're actually programming the, 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 uh, the, the robots to deliver packages. The students were doing that. It was the most amazing thing. This was a public school. 
every school should have that. Every school should be a community school. You heard me talk about that earlier, that, you know, I, I love science, I do. But I was very clear. I wasn't teaching science. I was teaching students the love of science. It's a very big difference between those two things. And so when we think about what we want, we want every school to be a community school where we are surrounding those students with everything they need. So we know, because we know if they're hungry, they can't learn. If they can't see, they can't learn. If they don't see their community as part of their learning, if they're not understanding and, and, and realizing the assets of the communities they come from, then they're not gonna have that self-worth and that self-esteem. They're not gonna have that. We want every school to be that. So as we see the proliferation of the crazy and the stupid all over this country, where people are standing up and trying to deny our students freedom to learn, every one of us needs to be at that school board meeting. You need to be there. That's your school board. And I need you to not just stop there. I need you to run for the school board. That's what I need you to do. I'm talking to the young people too. You need to run. You need to be on the school board. You need to know about budgets and where that budget is going to. You need to fight for, for your school district to have those um, a, 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 a dual language immersion classes because we know that students who, learn, who know how to speak more than one language do better in math and do better in science. You need to be there lifting up your voice. You need to help me take over the world. Did I say that into the microphone? Is this on? Because that's my, that's my master plan. And part of that is that you are running for everything. The NEA has a program called See Educators Run. Because if educators were in charge of everything, we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? right? That's exactly right. And we support them not only in winning at the school board level, becoming state legislators, becoming members of Congress, all the way up. Then you see we take over the world. That's what we do. And we are fighting to make sure. This is what we're fighting for, that we have schools that have that everywhere, that we have schools that see our students as who they are, that every single one of our students who graduates from our school will know the promise of America. So when we, when we think about the poetry of the United States Constitution, we the people, we the people, we the people, all of us deserve the right to be truly free. So when we are seeing people trying to take over school boards, no, we're on the school board. We are sitting there, we are standing up. We at the NEA are working with LULAC, the Color of Change, and other organizations of color to prepare parents and students to stand at those school board meetings and demand what our students need and what they deserve so that every school in this country looks like the best public school in this country and we have taken over the world. Si se puede. Se puede. Uh, Mr. Olmos, we're about to wrap up. What words of uh, wisdom, you know, I always say wisdom is just young people learning from their mistakes over and over again, and I'll make it up again, is that what words of wisdom can we give uh, the people out here in the audience about what, uh, what, what you've learned and what you can give to them to let them achieve their dreams or the goals, whether it's to be the first astronaut on Mars, uh, the person, the doctor who finds a cure for cancer, or maybe the first Latina, Latino president of the United States who gets sworn down here at the White House. What do you recommend? You know, I've said it a couple of times, and I really do mean it. Uh, 
you're looking <laughs> at the first and only Chicano in the history of this country to ever be nominated for an Academy Award as a leading actor in the history of this country. I am it. <laughs> I'm it. I'm the only one. How terrible is that? How ugly is that? Beautiful. Oh, my God, Ed, we love you. Thank you. No. What happened? What happened is that we have not risen to the level of expectation. We have to rise to the level of expectation. We have to go and be the best that we can be. How do you do that? It's simple. It's easy. Listen to me well. Discipline yourself to do the things you don't like to do, like brushing your teeth, so that you'll have the discipline to do the things you love to do when you don't feel like doing it. And that makes you, every single one of you, whether you be 90, whether you be 80, whether you be 30, whether you be 15 or 12 or 10, you will be the best that you can be by doing that every single day. You'll be one day old in doing it, or 36, 36 days worth doing it, or maybe one year or two years. Name me one musician that doesn't play her, their instrument every day. And if you see that, that person is not a musician. They do it automatically. Great athletes. Do you think, they, do you think, do you think you know, Kobe came out of his mother's womb bouncing a basketball? Not even close. The history of life is that you discipline yourself to do the things you love to do. And you can do it at 80. You can do it at 70. You can live your dream. You can start at any given level to dream it, capture it, and then do it every day. Seven days a week. You either read about it, talk about it, do it, or watch somebody do it. Every day, your dream. So you constantly keeping it clean, putting it back in your pocket. And you don't even have to tell anybody that you're doing it. You don't have to challenge yourself by telling others so that they in turn say, how's your dream going? You don't have to do that. You can keep it within yourself so that it doesn't put any more pressure on you than you already, because it is difficult. It gets difficult because sometimes we turn around and need, well, I'm going to be a, uh, you know, I want to be an actor. And the first thing your parents are going to say, man, no, look, at, why don't you go be a doctor or a lawyer or something? No, I want to be an actor. When my father, I was an, a great athlete, when I ended up becoming uh, a rock and roll singer at the age of 14, and I, and I put my cleats and my baseball glove in my bat, I put it away, and my father and my coaches and, and LA Dodgers said, what are you doing? Because I was already geared, they were already. I was already catching Eddie Roebuck, and you know, and 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 I was 13, 12, 13 years old. And I was playing with the pros, all the pros during the winter ball, winter season, off season, and I was only 13, 12, 13, and I was a little kid. I wasn't a big kid. I wasn't where I am today in respects of even my height. It's nothing. I was a little kid, but I could play really well. So everybody thought I was going to be a ball player, and everybody, including my father, everybody. And lo and behold, I became a rock and roll singer, and I couldn't sing. I'm serious. I still can't sing. But boy, can I perform. I can perform. Did anybody see Zoot Suit? Okay, if you haven't seen it, you should take a look at it. You'll see me singing, dancing, doing comedy, you know, and creating a character. I did, I did. I saw it. <laughs> you know, I learned something. I learned that I could live my dream. And I learned that I could be the best that I could be. Didn't make me better than, you know, Barbara Streisand. Didn't make me better than, you know, Al Pacino. I didn't. No. What it made me was the best that I could be. And guess what? The best that I could be became some of the best in the world. I got an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor, and I should have won for Jaime Escalante. That, that we, I should have won that, that award. They you were robbed. It, they gave it to Dustin Hoffman. For Rain Man, you know, and I got to tell you, the performance difference is night and day. I mean, what I did was extraordinarily different than what Dustin Hoffman did, but that's two different kind of movies. But no, there was no, 
no comparison to the difficulty of what was done. What it took to do Jaime versus what it took to do what, what D Dustin did, big difference. And look what happened. No one even, uh, how many of you have seen Rain Man? I don't think anybody. How many of you have seen Stand and Deliver? Everybody. And if you haven't seen it, you're going to see it in school. Trust me, your school teacher is going to pass it on you. How many of you saw it in school, by the way? And school teachers, look at this. It's incredible. It's beautiful. So all I can say, the best thing that we can do for ourselves is to make ourselves the best that we can be. And you do that too by yourself. You do it by reading about it, by watching it, by doing it, by watching, you know, by talking about it with other artists in your field that you want to be involved with. And that's if you want to be an artist. And if you want to be a doctor, the same thing. If you want to be a lawyer, the same thing. A geog you know, study geography. You want to, whatever, a pilot. You got to read books on now about that. You know, you, you start maybe thinking that you really start to study your profession when you're in college. <laughs> You started, you started in grammar school, if you can, if you can tune in. And even if you don't use it, you, if you can just start your discipline to work, then you can use it anywhere. You don't have to, like I said, we're not making filmmakers here. We're making lifelong learners. Rafael, last uh, comments you'd like to make to the audience today about your experiences and any life uh, advice you might have. Um, no, the only thing that I shared at the very beginning that I hope everyone realizes is that when it comes to education, the problem is never the student. It's, it, it's the adults, let's be real. So like our Madam President said, if you want to change that, it's time for you to become those adults. It's time for you to run. It's time for you to replace the folks in the positions of power because that's the only way any change is going to be made. And like Mr. Romo said, if anyone wants to work in the entertainment industry, the only thing I will share is regardless of what any producer, lawyer, or executive tells you, Hollywood is an industry that runs on story. So the most powerful people are the storytellers. So learn how to write, because then you will never be fighting for a job because you create the opportunities. That's it. Let's give a big hand to our members today.